Hi, I'm Karen, an environmental educator here at the Greenbelt. Welcome to this edition of Virtual Family Science Night, brought to you by Con Edison. Thanks to generous donations from Con Edison, we were able to put on this program and so many more to bring to you at home. For today's Family Science Night, we are going to be studying microbes, bacteria in particular. Um, microbes are these small, tiny little organisms that are living all over the place. They're on surfaces that we touch. Some of them live, in, live inside our body. Um, and they include things like bacteria, like this little guy right here, um, fungi, molds, and even yeast. So most of them are so small we can't see them with our naked eye. We need some kind of instrument, like a microscope, to see them. But what we're going to do today is use this really cool thing called a Petri dish. And what we can do with this Petri dish is take those microbes, put them inside here, and grow them. So once we grow them, they form into something called a colony. They reproduce to such a great number that we can actually see them with our naked eye. So inside this Petri dish, basically, it's a little dish with a cover. All right, the cover helps to keep some moisture inside and keeps other things from getting into our sample. And it also has this growing medium inside of it. Um, this is made out of agar, I believe, and some nutrients. So just like we need nutrients to feed our bodies, bacteria and other microbes need nutrients to grow as well. So we're gonna take some swabs and see what kind of bacterias or molds are growing in and around our office. So let's hope it's nothing too gross. <laughs> the Petri dish is a very important scientific tool and it's helped to lead to many discoveries, especially in advancements in medicine. So it was created by a German bacteriologist named Julius Richard Petri, who was alive from 1852 to 1921. In 1928, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin using a Petri dish. It was completely by accident. He was studying bacterias that were harmful like Staphylococcus and something had contaminated his Petri dish. That something was a mold called penicillin. And what he noticed was this penicillin mold was killing the bad bacteria. This later became the first antibiotic. And as we all know today, antibiotics are super important to keeping us all healthy and well. For today's experiment, you will need the following materials. Petri dishes, something to label the Petri dishes, either a Sharpie marker or a grease marker, Q-tips, and a thermometer to monitor the temperature that you will have your Petri dish stored in. There aren't too many steps in this experiment, but the first thing we're going to do is take our Petri dish, which looks like this, and we are going to label it. So I divided my Petri dish up into four parts. You can divide it in half, or you can just do one sample if that's what you choose. Um, and what I'm going to sample today is our keyboard, um, the iPad that is filming this right now, uh, one of our turtles, which we're going to be very delicate and gentle with, and Bob, who is our bobcat behind me. He's not a real live bobcat, but he is a taxidermy bobcat who's been in our office for quite some time, so it should be interesting to see what's on there. Uh, then my co-educator, Chris Ricker, is going to take his own, label it, and see what he comes up with. So here we are at my desk, and as you can see, I have one side labeled for keyboard. Now, I labeled this on the bottom, so when I look through it, I know which part of the Petri dish I am swabbing and where I'm gonna put those, uh, hopefully, not so many microbes. So I'm going to do a swab in here. I'm gonna get in there, see what kind of stuff is living. Ooh, and try not to break it though. <laughs> so be a little gentle. You can see there's already dirt on there. Now gently, you don't wanna to go too hard because you'll push right through the agar. And we're just gonna kind of squiggle it around. So I don't know if you can see that. It did leave behind some of that dirt that was in my keyboard. And we'll see what's growing there. So here I am with Flower, who's being very patient and standing still for the moment. 
and I'm taking a new Q-tip, not using the same Q-tip that I used for the keyboard for two reasons. First of all, I don't want to put that on flour. And second of all, if I put that with the same Q-tip, I'm going to mix the bacteria and the microbes up and we don't really want to do that. It'll mess up our sample a little bit. So I found my spot that says turtle and I'm just gonna rub it on her shell. So if you do use any of your pets, be gentle with them. She's not happy with me right now. But you can see she's a little dirty too. And gently rub that on here. And we're gonna not let her escape. Come on back here. And I think that's all you need to do. Again, if you're using any live animals, like you could test out your dog or cat's fur, but be gentle with them and don't hurt them. Um, if you do anything on yourself, do not stick these Q-tips up your nose or in your ears, right? We're not doing COVID testing. Um, we're just gonna use maybe our hands. You could even use maybe your neck, um, but don't put the Q-tips anywhere where you could hurt yourself or anyone else. And here I am with Bob, our stuffed Bobcat. And as you can see, Bob has not been dusted for quite some time. So this should be interesting. I'm going to take another clean cotton swab or Q-tip and oof. Oh, that's not good. You can see some stuff coming out of there. Rub it over here. Got a couple of spider webs on there as well. Try not to get that into your Petri dish. And I'm gonna find the spot that says Bob. Maybe I'll try and make a smiley face. Let's see what happens. <laughs> All right, so we have tested Bob. All right, so the next one that I'm going to do and the last one on this Petri dish is the iPad, which we are filming with right now. So I'm gonna start right here. We clean this up pretty much every time we use it. So let's see what's happening. And again, you don't have to do it too hard. You can see it's making a little bit of a mark there. So that's where we'll probably see bacteria growing. And we'll see how clean our iPad is. Um, when you're done, take all your dirty Q-tips and throw them in the garbage, okay? Because they are now contaminated with microbes. So we don't want those lying around. So now I'm here with our educator, Christopher Ricker, and I'm going to walk him through this activity and see how he does. So the first thing we're going to do is label the Petri dish. So here's our Petri dish, and there is his little grease marker. Now the reason we don't want to label the top is because the top moves. So you want to make sure you're labeling it on the side that has the nutrient medium. That way you know exactly where you put those microbes. So Chris is going to show us what he's going to do. And Chris, are you going to divide into half or into quarters? So for mine, I'm going to divide it in half because I'm just going to do two different samples. Okay. So, so you can put bigger samples on if you do it um, half and half. So I'm putting B for beard on this side because I'm going to test my beard and I'm going to put H on this side because I'm going to test my hand. Let's fix that H. And you can label your Petri dish however you like, as long as it's something you can remember. Um, I wrote everything out, but I think Chris can remember that it's his beard or his hand. So now we're going to go over to our Q-tips. And there's two per pack. So Chris, you can open one of those up. And what are you going to test first? I am going to test my beard first. So I hope you took a shower today, <laughs> but we'll see what's living inside the beard. <laughs> so we're getting a real good sample. And I'm gonna just smear that around the side with the bee, so we know that's for Chris's beard. Alrighty. 
And Chris is covering that up in between, which is a good idea. So we're not getting contaminated from anything floating around in the air. So now again, take a new Q-tip, right? So there's two in that pack, but this is a new Q-tip. And what are you going to try next? So Chris is going to do his hand. Now, another cool experiment you could try is try your hand and then use hand sanitizer and then try your hand again to see how well that hand sanitizer is working. You could do the same with a dirty hand and then wash your hands and make sure you're cleaning your hands well enough. So now from here, we need to store this Petri dish and give it a chance to grow. Now we have to store our Petri dishes to let all of those microbes grow into colonies so we can see them and try to ID them. Um, we have heat lamps for our reptiles, which work nicely for this. Um, you want it to be about 85 to 95 degrees. That would be optimal. Uh, you can see right here we have our light for Cornelius, which is a heat lamp, and we have our Petri dishes right above that. And I also have a thermometer. So we don't want this to go over 95 degrees. If it gets much hotter than that, it will just end up killing the bacteria. And we don't want it to go too low to freeze the bacteria because that will also kill it. But if it's a little bit lower than 85 degrees, it's not that big of a deal. It might just take a longer time for that bacteria to grow. To grow. So um, 85 to 95 degrees is optimal. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and it's going to probably take about a week or two for our results to come through. So it's been about a week since we set up our samples and we did get some bacterial growth. Some things to note, um, we kept these at about 85 degrees out of direct sunlight. You don't want direct sunlight on these. And we taped them shut. And the reason that we taped them shut is to contain any bacteria that's growing inside of that Petri dish. While it's probably harmless, we don't want to take any chances. So once you tape it shut, don't open it back up. Um, so here's Chris's sample, and this was Chris's hand. So there is some bacteria on his hand, but that's kind of normal. It's really hard to keep our hands clean because we're constantly touching things. So this is why it's really important to wash our hands often. And inside Chris's beard, it's really clean. So that's a good thing, right? So Chris showered that day. And we can see he has one little colony of bacteria. Um, when we look at them closely later, we'll see that they are slightly different. There's some different patterns in those bacteria, and that's gonna help us uh, maybe identify these bacteria. Now in our second sample, we got lots and lots of bacteria growth. So this first one is my keyboard. And not too much growing there, which I'm very happy about, um, which means I'm keeping my keyboard clean. Then in our next section here, we have Bob the Bobcat that we sampled and you can see that bacteria is very similar to the bacteria that was in my keyboard. So I'm thinking that it might be something in the dust in our building. And there is one like kind of jelly looking bacteria right there and it's a little bit like a bubble. So that's an identifying characteristic of that little colony. Again, that'll help us later on to maybe identify what type of bacteria is growing. Um, now we have our turtle here, and we have some kind of jelly-like smaller colonies of bacteria, and we have this filamentous uh, or stringy type of bacteria. So there's a lot of bacteria in flowers, on flower shell that we sampled, but that's probably because she lives in the water. Um, she has some food maybe decomposing in there. She has her waste in there. So this is probably a normal bacterial colony or a turtle that's living in the water. We don't want her water to get too dirty, but I don't think that's abnormal. And then we have our iPad, which Chris is using right now, which has all of these stringy filamentous um, bacteria growing. So I'm not really sure what that is. We're gonna do a little research and try and figure it out. So when we talk about how we identify these bacteria, we probably won't be able to identify them down to the actual species of bacteria, but by looking at the size, the shape, and the color, we can kind of narrow it down. In order to ID the types of bacteria we have in our Petri dish, 
we can use something called colony morphology. And that is a method to describe the characteristics of the bacteria in order to try and identify what type of bacteria you're looking at. So we can use size, shape, color, and opacity or the clarity of the samples to try and get an idea of what types of bacteria we're looking at. So the first thing we're gonna look at is our form. So are they circular, are they irregular, are they filamentous or rhizoid? And those are all different um, shapes that you can see in each colony. If you're having a hard time really seeing that, you can take a picture with your phone and blow it up and you'll see a lot more detail that way. Um, some of these are also elevated a little bit, some of them are flat, and sometimes they're kind of bubble-like, and you can look at that as a way to ID as well. And we look at the edges or the margins. So you might have one form inside the colony and the edges look a little bit different. So we can take a look at those and that's also gonna help us identify. Um, sometimes you do get different colors inside your Petri dish. We don't really have too many colors today. Most of it is white or off-white, but once in a while you might get a pink or a yellow or an orange and that's kind of interesting. You might also get yeast or mold inside of your Petri dish and those will look slightly different than the bacteria cultures. So do a little research and see what type of bacteria you have in your Petri dish. You can also send us pictures of your samples to sigreenbelteducation at gmail.com. So once you're finished with growing your colonies of bacteria, again, keep it closed. But what you want to do is put it into a Ziploc or a closable bag and close it up real good. And then you can dispose of that into the regular garbage can. Um, again, we don't want this bacteria kind of getting into the environment just in case it's something that's not safe. I'm actually going to try and grow mine for another week or so and see what happens. Thank you for joining us for our virtual edition of Con Edison's Family Science Night in the Greenbelt. For more virtual content, check us out at sigreenbelt.org or you can visit us on our Facebook channels, the Greenbelt Environmental Education page or our Greenbelt Conservancy page. And check us out on our YouTube channel, the Staten Island Greenbelt. See you soon.